before we get into today's episode, a quick note. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. This podcast should not be considered professional advice. Where guests appear on the YouTube channel and the Lumiant Live podcast, the views of those guests are solely their views, and Lumiant does not accept responsibility for them. You should take all steps necessary to ascertain that the information you receive from the YouTube channel and the Lumiant Live podcast is correct and has been verified. Now, please enjoy today's episode. Welcome to part two of our two-part chat with Adam Drinkwater from Trace the Wealth and his client, Steve Mark. In part one, we unpacked Steve's experience going through the Lumiant values-based advice experience with his advisor, Adam. And now in part two, you're about to jump back into the conversation where we tap into Steve's legal ethics background in working with the FASIA Code of Ethics Education Program to unpack his views and reflections on the Lumian advice experience and get Adam's reflections on how he interprets this from an advisor perspective. Enjoy. So let's um, let's change seats. Let's change pace. Let's... Um, we, we've sort of gone through the, you know, the majority of the experience you, you received, Steve, as a client. And, you know, part of the reason for us uh, moving and getting you on board today to have this chat is to get your views from your, your, you know, your background, right? So as, as um, someone that's you know, quite well versed in, in, that would be an understatement, but legal ethics um, and, you know, you've, you've helped develop the ethics education program. Uh, for the FASEA Code of Conduct. Um, going through that experience and in your professional sort of reflection, um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on the end-to-end values-based experience that Adam executes through, through Lumiant? Well, let me start from a slightly different perspective. And that is that for many years, because I was president of the Anti-Discrimination Board before I was Legal Services Commission, not that this matters, it's not about me, but it's about the fact that in both of those industries or both of those areas, um, I had to deal with regulation. So in a sense, I was a regulator. And what I have found in my practice and in my and just my dealings with the world is nobody likes regulators. Uh, everybody hates regulators. Um, and, you know, we won't even start mentioning FASIA, but the, <laughs> the issue about that hatred is well-placed because it appears to be not connected to me as a person, uh, me as a, an individual. It's just a blanket regulation I have to comply with. And why do I have to comply with it? They don't say that. So the, the issue for me when I'm talking to my students or when I'm dealing with my clients as a lawyer and as I experienced as a client with Mark or Adam, sorry, is the thing is when you, when you are in that, that situation, um, what is the process? Why, why, why is it regulated the way it is? So if I mention that horrible thing of FASIA and the, and the code of ethics and conduct, um, the, the thing that I would always advise people to look at and i have to cope with myself is what is it there for what's its purpose and if we if we really understand its purpose um then we can actually you know address that purpose do we agree with the purpose or we disagree with the purpose if we agree with the purpose, great, let's do it. Let's work out the best way to achieve it. If we disagree with the purpose, why do we disagree with the purpose? Then maybe we should go out and lobby or whatever we should do, but maybe we should work out how we can best use the process, which I, we think is flawed in achieving that purpose um, and, and get beyond it. So in a, in a sense, my whole point as a regulator is to work out how people don't need me. Yeah, you know, so, so when I when I was legal services commissioner, the first thing they asked me um, is, "What are you going to do? You're going to go out and you're going to prosecute more lawyers because that's what the community wants." And I said, "That's not what the community wants. The community wants wants a situation where they don't have to prosecute them. 
You know, we want to reduce complaints against them. We want to make them better. We don't want to prosecute more. And the same thing's true about when you're looking at a regulation. So my apologies for the lengthy introduction. However, when I'm looking at the FASIA, there are a couple of the standards that usually cause a lot of difficulty. Um, and the the standard, the standard around conflicts is standard three and the standard four and the standard five. Uh, but the, the, there seem to be three major issues that affect financial advice that affects me as a client. The first one is conflicts of interest. What does that mean and how do we address it? The second one is um, making sure that the financial advisor is meeting the best interest test meeting my best interest and doing the best interest for me. And, and the third is making sure that they're getting informed consent. Now those three things, as a lawyer, I could destroy this entire presentation because it would take 40 hours to try to describe how difficult those three concepts are in law. But that's not the point. The point is that people don't understand them. And so, um, it, and I, I suspect some of the advisors don't understand them. I have not had that experience, thank goodness, with Adam. However, the first thing is the, the concept of, well, um, conflict of interest. You know, do I want to assess my advisor? Do I ask, have to ask my advisor, do you hold shares in BHP? Are you recommending me or are you recommending that I have that part of my profile? Is that conflict of interest? If, if, the, if the client has a level of knowledge that they would ask that question, the advisor has to have a process by which it is answered. And it is easily answered. The beauty of the way that Adam and I worked together, because I had all that knowledge, we didn't have to go through it you know, surreptitiously. We had to actually, do, we dealt with it directly and it, it's not a problem. So the, the way that an advisor can address that question is by putting everything on the table and you know say is there a conflict of interest how could there be and just dispelling that um, and that's only when the client actually even understands what a conflict of interest is the, the second thing which is even more important is the best interest test um i go back to some of my earlier comments to understand how to meet the best interest test as an advisor, you have to understand what the client's interests are. And that's what this whole um, podcast is about. It's what Luminate does with your videos. It's what Adam does with his advice. And I think they're both extremely good. And so gold stars. However, the, the, the problem is that we have to keep developing them. And uh, I think that in, in developing the best interest test, one of the biggest problems that some advisors might have, because I know clients do, and I know lawyers do when they're dealing with their clients, is who determines the best interest? Is it the client or is it the advisor? You know, if the advisor, if, if the client wants to put money into something that they are passionate about, but the advisor thinks it's gonna not work, or is not going to achieve a financial result, but the, the client is not all that interested in the financial re result. They're interested in, in a you know, community result or a relationship result or something else. How does, the, how does the advisor know that? And how does the advisor advise? Where you have a fiduciary duty to advise on one level, you can't you can't let your client do things that you know are against their interests and you have to advise them of that fact, but ultimately they make the decisions. And so it's how you, how you navigate that relationship of who determines the best interest that's really important. Um, and I think that because of the videos that you use, which touch on this a lot, and the fact that the advisor knowing about it as Adam does, it became a situation which we discussed this issue as we're discussing it now, rather than having to kind of ring around it or, or 
talk around it until you can actually open up little bits of it um, for 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 a client. But it is this it is the skill of a good advisor to be able to determine what the best interest of the client is. The problem is that the way the rule is structured, it, it Im impacts some advisors on not asking, asking any questions at all. So if an advisor becomes risk advice because of regulator pressure, then the client's gonna suffer. And so that's where you know, the concern about educating people about how to deal with the, um, the, vice, the, the, the code of conduct comes. Yeah. So, you know, we, we could get into this for hours, right? But the, the, key, the key points I, I love you bringing up there, in particular around some of the, the standards that are in there, is that if they are questions that a client may have to prove your, you know, your, your ethical standing, you as an advisor must have a process to have those answered. And, you know, for, for one example, when it's about meeting my best interest, the, the question here is, how do you determine best interest? Well, step one is you must first demonstrate that you understand the client. And I think that's a really important reflection. And, and Adam, I might get you to comment on this, right? Because you run the process, you know, you, you use Lumiant, you've, you've turned Lumiant and what it provides you in terms of values cards and investment preference videos into a process that you you still have to bring it to life, right? With your conversation, you know, hearing that from Steve as a, as a responsible advisor yourself, Adam, how does it make you feel to hear that from Steve? And how does it make you feel to, to reflect on your process and how it's helped delivering that? Yeah, I was thinking when Steve was talking actually about how much of this is a mindset more than a process or how much of it is a mindset more than a regulation. So when you think through the concept of under regulation or over regulation a lot of people would say oh we're so over regulated well the reason you're over regulated is because over years there's been a requirement to over regulate now one of the problems that creates is if you look at the figures in australia of people who don't receive advice it's not great and it's not great because either they've known about poor experiences in the past or over regulation prevents uh, provides barriers such as cost or unpleasant processes to go through so how do you you know help start to fix the problem of overregulation. well it's a change in mindset and making sure that people who provide advice understand all the elements we've talked about and make it a natural part of the process so that then regulators don't have to be so heavy-handed and you start to then get more people approaching advice with a more comfortable perspective but that that only is achieved by people understanding the mindset of what they need to do in the advice industry in order to make that happen so it's great that you know that steve talks about what we went through as a process and we have the lumion process in terms of a tool to use to enable that but it's it's so important for people to understand why it exists and why they need to use it you don't have to use you know it's, it's not that you have to use Lumion is that you have to have the mindset and understanding that you have to go through this with people to understand how well you can help them. And if there is a collective approach to do that, then there doesn't need to have to be over-regulation and you'll start to reduce barriers and you'll start to get more people approaching the advice industry which they need to do and they should do. Yeah, I mean, to provide a balanced view here, right, you don't need to use Lumion to do any of this. To your point, Adam, you must have a mindset, however, that relies on getting to know the client to a depth that, you know, and to your point, Steve, who determines this depth that either you're comfortable with or the client is comfortable with. Um, and maybe you'd throw in the regulator is comfortable with as well um, because they, they still have a, an iron in the fire. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, being able to develop a process and use a process that helps you articulate and, and go through that, right? So, Steve, you know, if I if I can touch on on that mindset that Adam spoke about, how do you how do you see mindset sort of playing into delivery of those questions that you sort of threw out there, and and how important do you believe is mindset in in bringing to life this process and and this you know way of of delivering your ethical obligation? Okay, well, I'll, I'll start talking about in the concept of regulation just for a moment and then bring it down to the interpersonal stuff because the thing I think that we, that advisors would benefit from is to actually 
look at what the regulation is and work through the, the fog and the anger and the, the, the concern that they might have about the use of the words and work out what is it there for? What is the purpose of the regulation? And then work out how in their office and how in their interactions with clients, they actually make it come alive. And they actually meet that the purpose of the regulation. Because meeting the purpose of the regulation is 99% sure you're not going to actually find yourself in clash with the regulator. So, so that's, that's the first point, finding out what the purpose is rather than just resisting it. Because people that resist it tend to just apply guidelines. You know, I'll, I'll just follow a guideline. And by following a guideline, it tends to mean that you forget you're talking to a human and you're dealing with a real person that doesn't necessarily fit between the block letters lines of a, of a guideline. So just relying on the purpose is the first. Part. The second point is, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, having a process and having a mindset, as Adam says, of wanting to find out who the client is. I mean, what does the client need? How are you going to meet the best interests of a client without understanding what their interests are? And, and the problem that that presents for advisors is people are resistant often about disclosing who they are. You know, they, they don't necessarily want to, and as I said again earlier, a person that goes to a professional advisor prepares themselves. And by preparing themselves, they create a mindset. So they walk into the office with a mindset that usually is incorrect. I know it often is in law, um, and I'm sure that it's similarly incorrect in financial advice, or, or when I say incorrect, not in their best interest. And so that finding out how to, how to navigate through that is about interpersonal skills and communication skills. And, you know, the, the thing that I found when I was the regulator of the legal profession is the biggest area of complaint when you boiled it down. 80% of all complaints were based on failure to communicate. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it wasn't very similar in the financial advice industry. Anecdotally, I'm told that that is the case. So, you know, how much do we know about how to, you know, educationally to, to educate our advisors to be aware of their client's state of mind? How do we, how, how well do we do that? And, and um, how, how do we continue to grow in, in that knowledge and that, and that educational knowledge is a really, really important issue. And, you know, to try to bring it back down to the reality of my interaction with Adam that happened because I have a passion about this area and Adam allowed me to exercise my passion and therefore um, found out a lot about me and then could tailor things towards what um, my, my actual needs are. And so he, to meet the best interest test, Adam was very successful in finding out what my interests are. Um, it's as simple as that. I love that. And it's a really interesting concept you present. And we've spoken about it a bit, right? When Adam was doing his pre-positioning call in that if a client is putting on a persona based on their assumption of the experience they're going to go through and, and what the advisor is going to ask them, um, then you're not advising the authentic client because they're, they're presenting you the persona that you then end up advising on. And, you know, as Adam so um, delicately does, you, you, the role of the advisor is to start to peel back those layers of what's the persona they're putting on, what are the, what's the, you know, the, the little obstacles they're putting in the way of giving me what's really and truly important to them. And that's, Adam, I suppose you're, your pride and your role as, a, as an advisor to, to really articulate that and unpack that. Yeah, I think you, you, you like most advisors they have to believe in what you're doing and you're passionate about doing it. And I think when you think through regulations and for want of a better term, box ticking in our industry, it's like at school, if you revised for your exam to pass your exam, you very rarely used or remembered anything that you revised for because you weren't you weren't learning, you know, weren't passionate about what you're learning. You were just trying to tick the boxes of the exam. 
and it's not too dissimilar with this. And I, I you know, the, the work that would have gone into design FASIA and the learning processes and all the education requirements that have to be done. If you take the view that you just have to do it to pass the exam or to tick the boxes in the same way that you do with advice, then you're only just jump, you're going from step to step to step to step. You're not really changing or influencing anything. Whereas, you know, that material has been put together for a reason. And, you know, if you, if you choose to embrace that and understand it all and learn where you can, then the boxes naturally get ticked because you're doing the right things anyway. And yes. you're influencing and creating change in the right way. So I think that's, that's just something you pick up. And look, I suppose by design, it, the system and the way it works is would hopefully weed out the ones that are trying to box tick because that's where the problems are created in industry and that's why you get over regulation so you know it's, it's it's no coincidence that it's designed that way but i think that's how you've got to embrace it and um and try and see it as an opportunity to progress yeah I, and i think that's so important it's a, it's a great reflection that um you know the way that Lumion's designed and, you know, people can use whatever software system they, they choose, but it, it, it prioritizes depth of conversation over speed to, you know, as you put it, Adam, ticking boxes, right? Because you could, you could get goals by ticking a box. You could get a risk profile by ticking 10 boxes. You know, you, you can do all those things and, and arguably, you know, um, on paper satisfy your obligation, but, you know, when you when you really get into the depth of the detail, you know, you need to go to some level of detail. To, <laughs> to, yeah, to and a lot of the time, you're not you're not you're not replacing often the things that you used to do or that you need to do. You're just adding extra layers to it or making it richer. So, you know, if you think through meetings in the past where so often was amazing conversations took place, all this rich information was there, and at the end of it. 10% was used because it was the 10% that was needed to fulfill a requirement. So you're still fulfilling the requirements, still doing the same things, but you're adding so many extra layers to it and making it such a richer experience. And ultimately, you know, often in our world as advisors, we, we see the world through what we have to do day to day and you get into the motion of doing things, whereas you just have to be a client for once to understand what that feels like. And, and more often than not, I always try and do the things that, I would advise on or experience in myself. So, you know, I did the Lumion process, I've done it a few times, done it with my partner, done it on my own. And you, you, by going through that, you understand the difference or you understand the end um, experience and therefore the way you then talk to people or go through a process or think through advice changes. So um, it is always critical to do that as well. I, I find it a really powerful part. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You know, we've covered so much today and, and you know, towards the end of all our podcasts, we, um, we share, you know, we ask our, our, our guests to share a bit of a top tip for, for those advisors that are in our audience thinking about uh, doing a values-based advice experience, or maybe they are doing one and, and, you know, they're sort of going, well, what do I do, do with it? I mean, we've just given a, a, a you know, a ton of top tips, but, um, Steve, I might start with you from a client perspective or even from your professional perspective. If, if you were speaking to our audience who are advisors thinking about or doing a values-based advice experience, what might one tip be for, from your perspective? For an advisor? Yeah. Uh, for an advisor. Um, it's to recognize the fact, as I've mentioned several times during the interview, that um, the client comes there with a mindset. And the thing is that, uh, as we all know from the, the Hain Royal Commission and various other things and lots of media things, you know, financial advisors are all slimy, horrible individuals that are just trying to make money off you. Um, and as we know from lawyers, going back to Shakespeare, let's kill them all. You know, that, that there, is, there is actually a mindset out there where people don't they, they come with a barrier to trust. Um, and therefore, my top tip is to be aware of that. And so, you know, if you know that your client's got a barrier to trust, what are you going to do? And what, what sort of communication skills are you going to exercise to, to, to get beyond that barrier? And a lot of it is revealing self, as we've already talked about. But that's the top tip is be aware that the, the client has a barrier to trust and it's your job to break through that barrier. And that's the first step that you need to take 
to be able to meet the best interest test, to be able to deal with the conflict of interest, to be able to deal with the concept of informed consent. How, how are you going to get any of those things when you don't have trust? I love that. That's um, that's that's wise wise words. Adam, what about yourself from the advisor perspective? Speaking to our advisor audience, what would what would a tip be from yourself? Uh, probably two things. So, first of which is to give yourself the opportunity to be great at it. In terms of give yourself the opportunity to understand why you're doing it and believe in it. So, if you don't do that it will very quickly come across in the person you're speaking to. So, you know, if you're going to engage in a new process or you're going to use something like, you know, throw yourself into it, give it the best chance. And the other part is be open-minded about who you're speaking to. So it's very easy sometimes to say, I don't think this person would want to go through this process. or I don't think this person would want to have these conversations. Or you don't know that. And the reason you don't know it is because you don't have the conversation. So, um, yeah, probably just being open-minded about who it is that you're dealing with because... As we all know, and we're probably all terrible at ever learning is uh, judging a book by its cover is very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more. I think if the last you know hour that we've spent together would tell us anything, there's um, you're in you're in tricky waters if you are judging a book by its cover um, for for many reasons. Adam, Steve, uh, you know, on behalf of our entire Lumion audience and on behalf of Lumion, uh, the, the company itself, I, I want to say thank you for spending the last hour with us um, and, and talking through your experience working together as advisor and client and, and Steve as, you know, a, a professional ethics lawyer, uh, given your background and, and um, you know, sharing those insights from, from all those perspectives. Um, this episode's one that's truly special to me and um, I can't thank you enough to, to share those insights. Um, I, I'm sure it'll be valuable to all our audience. Well, thank you very much for allowing us to be here. It's been wonderful. Thanks, Mark. It's been great to be a part of it. And thank you, Steve, as well, for sharing and being open about everything that we talked about. So it's great. Hopefully uh, it's a value. Absolutely. Thanks, gentlemen. Have a Pleasure. great day. Thanks, Mark.